I'm really excited to get the chance to kickstart the first uh, Information Theory Cryptography Conference, ITC 2020. Um, so I think with everything happening in the world today, we all feel like we're living in historic times. We are witnessing history and um, maybe perhaps a lot of it is depressing or uh, makes us angry and upset. So it's nice today to be witnessing a momentous historic event that we can all feel good about. Um, the birth of a new conference, uh, ITC. So it's actually uh, less of a birth and more of a resurrection. So for those of you who may not know, there used to be a conference called ICITS, um, International Conference in Information Theoretic Security, uh, that ran from 2005 to 2017. It was a really nice conference. I had a chance to attend one in Lugano. Um, um, so it was a really nice conference, but I think there was a feeling among the community that it didn't have as much traction uh, as it should. And so ITC is really an attempt to reboot this conference, to resurrect it with a new name, a new steering committee, and a new sense of excitement to make this, uh, uh, to, to make it have traction, make it a, a, a really great publication venue and a great venue that uh, people will, will attend. Um, so uh, uh, so that's ITC. Um, um, so the conference is dedicated to all kinds of, uh, all aspects of information theory cryptography. And one decision we made early on is uh, to take a fairly broad interpretation of this scope. So it doesn't mean we're only interested in works that are information theoretic as an end result, that don't use computational assumption. Any work that has some interesting information theory component is really of interest to, to this conference. So here are some sample topics, and of course you'll get a flavor of uh, what kind of uh, topics are part of this conference by seeing the talks. Uh, we're interested in, thing, in things like secret sharing, MPC, multi-party computation, differential privacy, quantum information, uh, all kinds of codes, locally decodable codes, uh, authentication codes, non-malleable codes, proof systems, oblivious data structures, randomness extraction, et cetera, et cetera. So many, many other topics. So the conference really has two goals. One is to uh, disseminate recent research advances in information theory crypto. So that's the goal of both the accepted papers and the invited talks. Uh, you're going to hear about a lot of cool new results. And the other goal though, uh, sort of a broader goal is to foster the creation of a community that brings together researchers from several different areas, not just cryptography, but also areas like coding theory, information theory, theory of computation and privacy. Uh, of course, cryptography. So maybe it's a little harder to do with the virtual con content, but uh, I hope uh, we, we accomplished this anyway. Uh, uh, you'll get to hear talk from several of these uh, other areas as well. And uh, some of the people participating are, are, are not just core cryptographers, but also from, from uh, many of these other areas. And I think it's something that we need to strive to do even more to get uh, more people from more areas involved um, uh, in this conference. So here's the uh, here's just the information for ITC 2020 for this year's conference. So the general chairs are Yael Kalai and Adam Smith, uh, um, um, program chair. Here you see the program committee. So I want to just thank everyone uh, for doing a great job, selecting great papers. Uh, really, it was a very fun uh, experience. And. Um, so I wanted to give you a few stats for ITC 2020. So we had 39 submissions, uh, which initially I thought was maybe a little low. I was, uh, 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 I was hoping for more, but then I was, uh, uh, um, uh, I was very happy with maybe what we lacked in quantity, we made up for in quality. So the quality of the submissions was really great. Uh, we ended up accepting 16 of them. Um, um, and uh, we probably could have, uh, there were other good papers in the pile. So uh, if we rejected your paper, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, we, uh, because this was the first iteration of the conference, one thing we were very conscious of is making sure we set a high bar for a very high bar for the quality. So I think people weren't sure what to expect or weren't sure what the bar should be. And one decision we made is that we're going to uh, calibrate to TCC, which is a really great conference on the theory of cryptography. And we're going to sort of calibrate to that and set that as our bar. Um, um, so we wanted to you know, set the precedent that this will be a conference that, uh, where we accept uh, uh, top papers and uh, top, top works in the field. 
So we had 16 accepted papers. Um, I'm very, very happy with the, with the program. And we have six uh, invited talks that represent uh, greatest hits from the area. So these were selected uh, by the PC. Um, um, we asked for um, our, um, nominations from the community. Uh, we probably should have publicized that better. We only got two nominations from the community, but uh, we ended up discussing and coming up with a, a, a grade list uh, from the PC. And uh, I'm happy to say that all of the all of the talks we selected, uh, all of the speakers accepted uh, right away. So we had uh, this is the A team. It's it's all of our topics. It's the it's the six six uh, uh, talks that we picked. Um, so originally the conference was supposed to be in Boston, uh, but with COVID that changed. So now uh, the conference is happening in your home uh, virtually. Uh, so it's definitely less than ideal. This was not what we originally wanted, but uh, uh, I want to try to look at the positives. So I think there are some positive aspects. Uh, uh, I think a lot more, uh, many more people get to participate this way. So we have 360 uh, register, uh, registered participants. I see 68 participants are on, or 69 uh, are on right now. So that's probably more than we would have gotten if we were meeting physically. And so you can think of this as a free demo of ITC. You know, the first iteration of ITC is free. There's no registration. You don't have to fly anywhere. You just log in. It's easy. You can test it out, try it out, and hopefully we'll get you hooked. And for all the first future versions of ITC, you'll be willing to pay a registration fee and fly out uh, to wherever it's being held. Um, um, so, uh, um, so hopefully this will expose the conference to more people uh, than we normally would have. So let me say just a little bit about the format. Uh, we'll have, uh, for all the accepted paper sessions, we will start the session with a brief introduction by one of the PC members to all the talks in the session. And then each paper will have a very brief uh, five to eight minute live presentation. And you can think of these uh, live presentations as sort of teasers or sort of the equivalent, uh, uh, the video equivalent of a poster. Uh, on the website, uh, there's a link to the longer pre-recorded talk for each paper. So that's a 20 plus minute talk uh, uh, that you can access on the website. So if, if the five to eight minute brief presentation uh, uh, gets you interested, you should also view the longer talk. And all the papers are also available from the, the proceedings are available from the website. We are uh, published under uh, um, open access gold standard, so you can access all the papers uh, free from the website. So uh, after all the presentations, we're going to have a, Q a discussion and Q&A uh, that's uh, uh, with all of the speakers. Um, so you can write your questions in the Q&A as the talk is happening. Uh, the session chair might choose to uh, ask your question right after the talk, but for most questions, we're going to defer them until after all the talks in the session. And then we're going to have a discussion with uh, all the speakers and you might, uh, the session chairs might unmute you to ask your question. So be prepared if you ask a question that you might uh, get unmuted and, and be able to ask your question and discuss with the, with the speaker, um, ask follow-up questions, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's really pretty much it uh, for the format. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty much all I want to say. I just want to give a big thanks to many, many people who made this happen. So uh, thanks to the steering committee and especially Benny Applebaum, the chair, who gave meant much uh, very useful advice on, on how to run this conference. Uh, thanks to the general chairs, Adam and Yael. Uh, all the PC members and external reviewers, you guys did an excellent job selecting papers and uh, uh, giving good reviews. Uh, all the authors who submitted their works, all the speakers that, uh, that are going to speak in the next three days. Uh, Shai Halevi for his amazing uh, web review software. So that's what we use to review the submission. And lastly, so this conference is brought to you by Microsoft Research. They, they sponsor the conference and they allowed, uh, they, they allowed us to make registration completely free. Uh, so they're supporting both our webinar, webinar license and all the publication costs. So thanks to them as well. All right, so I'm gonna end here and I'll let the next session uh, take over. All right, thanks.
Daniel, for that uh, inspiring intro. And nice to see that we're living in historic times with the creation of ITC. And uh, Elizabeth looks great. Uh, your house looks very clean. Um, so uh, I'll keep this brief. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the differential privacy session. Uh, Daniel asked me to prepare like three minutes uh, introducing the talks. And um, it's a, a really easy job. These are a very coherent set of talks and all topics and so near and dear to my heart that I even have nice slide pictures, nice pictures of the models in my slides. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, this is a session on distributed differential privacy. So um, if you don't know what differential privacy is, you'll learn about it, but it's, um, this is going to be a talk about different distributed models of differential privacy. So the best known such model is local differential privacy, where we have a constellation of users who each uh, apply some method for making their data private and send this to some untrusted aggregator who will compile those messages into some useful statistical information. So if you've never seen this model, think about uh, trying to figure out how many of the users are smiling in the, on the left. Um, and the, this model has been used a lot and has had a lot of influence on the practice of differential privacy and deployments, but the problem is that it has a somewhat limited utility. There's not that much you can do in this model compared to what you could do if you were willing to trust the aggregator and pass all of the uh, data directly to the aggregator, even if the aggregator then has to only reveal private output. So by making this local, we give up a lot. And this is information theoretic cryptography. So everyone's already thinking, well, why don't we just use MPC uh, to simulate a trusted aggregator? Uh, but you know, as you know, the reason there's still conferences publishing papers on MPC is because that introduces a fair number of challenges in terms of efficiency and functionality and scalability. So th these talks are all about how we can get the better utility without going all the way to general MPC. Uh, so the first two talks are in a model that was introduced in Eurocrypt uh, 2019, inspired by some practical systems called the shuffle model. And the idea here is we're just going to put a simple uh, anonymization layer in between the messages and the aggregator. So we're not going to go all the way to a full like interactive protocol. We're just going to have some third party or some cryptographic scheme for shuffling the messages on the way to the aggregator. Uh, the first two papers are going to talk about what you can do and can't do in this model. So this model has um, inspired a lot of work on figuring out where it sits in between local differential privacy and the full power of trust of having a trusted aggregator. Um, so we have two nice papers. So uh, Victor is going to give a talk about work with Albert Chu on uh, separating this shuffled model from the local model and also from the uh, from the local model of privacy by studying um, the problem of computing a histogram of the user's data, a uh, conflict of interest statement. Uh, Albert is my PhD student and Victor is my uh, academic sibling. But uh, uh, hopefully you'll agree that this is a good paper um, that uh, all the committee members were very excited about. Um, and the second paper is uh, by Ghazi et al, Ghazi Golowicz, Kumar Manurangsi, Pe, and Velinker, uh, sorry if I mispronounced anyone's name, on pure differential privacy. So uh, this is another very nice result where uh, in differential privacy, there's often sort of a failure parameter or a security parameter. And uh, what they ask is whether you really need the error of the shuffle protocol to depend on the security parameter uh, or not. And they show that actually you don't. So only the kind of com computational cost can depend on the security parameter. So it's a very nice, um, a very nice result. The third talk is in uh, a different model that uh, I think they're calling the hybrid model. And what they ask is what if we augment local differential privacy with a small uh, kind of central differential right, or a, a, a small trusted curator. So what if we have a small subset of the users, like 1% of the users have um, pooled their data with some trusted party who can run a mechanism on all their data simultaneously. 
And what they give are interesting cases where this doesn't help and interesting cases where that does help. And one of the things I really like about this paper personally is that it's inspired by uh, a practical system uh, that one of the authors wrote. So this is a paper by Bemal Korolova, Nisim, Shepard, and Stemmer. And this is based on a practical system that uh, was introduced and worked uh, by several people, including Sasha Korolova. And I think it's a nice example of formalizing the power of a model that was inspired by, by practice. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to Victor, who I believe is giving the first talk. I don't want to waste any more of your time. But uh, I'm looking forward to these talks very much, and I, I hope you'll get a lot out of them. Thanks. So <clears throat> the first talk that we have is of the paper separating local and uh, shuffle differential privacy via histograms. Uh, Victor Balser and Albert uh, Chu are the co-authors, and Victor will be giving the short talk. Uh, hello. Um, okay, so start with the uh, histogram. So focus on histogram. So each user is going to have uh, one of d possible values, and we're the interested in um, looking at the error, the maximum error across all the bins of the histogram. And so I'll start by going over some already existing protocols in the shuffle model and what guarantees they have. So Chu and all show that um, you can get a max, uh, you can get error that's like square root log d, and each user is sending d message. Each user is sending d messages. Um, then another shuffle protocol by uh, Gazi and all show that they can reduce the communication complexity to polylogarithmic in d, while maintaining like similar error. Um, and then in our results. We show that this uh, dependence on D isn't necessary. And in particular, we get error 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta. But uh, the downside of our algorithm, our, our protocol, is that we have large communication, so each user is sending order D messages. So now, compared to the other models, like the local and shuffle, or sorry, to central and local, our algorithm gets. Um, Error very close to what's achievable in central. We're only off by like a one over epsilon factor. And then we get something that's better than what can be done in local since there's no lower bound in the local model where the error has to grow with um, has to grow with the D. Okay. So now I'll go over what our histogram protocol is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a binary sum protocol. And then we'll just use this binary sum protocol to um, count to count estimate the number of each of the counts in our for our histogram. And so then all, all these executions will define our histogram protocol. And essentially, uh, so we're going to need two properties from our from our binary sum protocol. The first we'll call bounded error. So the additive error is greater than alpha with at most order one over n probability. And here alpha is the final error that we want in the end. And then the second property that we want is what we'll call zero maps to zero. So when the true sum is zero, then our binary, our sum protocol has to always output zero. And this will be necessary in order to get error independent of d. And the reason for this is uh, when we, Normally, when we, take, um, we want to find the maximum error across all the bins, we'll take a union bound. But because of this zero maps to zero property, we only have to union bound over the non-zero bins, of which there are going to be at most n of them, since there's n users. So our histogram protocol gets, has a max error that's greater than alpha with at most uh, like constant probability. So now moving on to the uh, to the binary sum protocol. Essentially, what each user is going so each user has a bit input, and what they're going to do is they're just going to output a two message. They're going to output two messages. The first message is going to be whatever their input bit was, and the second message is going to be a random bit that's going to be one with probability p. And so, what the shuffler sees, the shuffler gets two n messages that are binary messages. So, and because all the messages are shuffled together, 
we can look at this out the output of the shuffler. And the output of the shuffler is equivalent to the sum of all the messages, because we can go back and forth between these two representations. So really, the output of our shuffler is like the sum, which in the case of our protocol is just going to be the true sum plus binomial noise. And so now to prove privacy, we just have to prove privacy of the sum. And then to get the accuracy guarantees that we want, we'll just do some post-processing on, on, on our noisy sum here. OK, so privacy is going to follow from prior results from Ghazi and all. Um, so I guess it's not really important for the rest of this talk what P is, but just though that we can satisfy privacy using binomial noise. Um, and then the, for the post-processing, what we're going to do is we're just going to, if our noisy sum is less than or equal to n, we'll just set it to 0. Otherwise, we'll do uh, the noisy sum minus np. So we subtract out the mean of the binomial in this case. And so it should be clear that we get the 0 maps to 0 property. Since if the true sum is 0, then our noisy sum is just binomial, which is always less than f. And then I won't go through a bounded error, but that will just fall from like concentration of uh, binomial distribution. Okay, so that's our binary sum protocol. So now I want to uh, just talk about one of the uh, an application of this, and we're going to use this to solve what's called we use we, can, we use to solve what's called a pointer chasing problem. And so here, this each user has data drawn from some distribution, and the question becomes is a, a question of sample complexity. So it's like, how many samples do we need in order to solve this pointer chasing problem? So I'll, I'll go, I'll define what the pointer chasing problem is. And so what we start, we start with two unknown permutations, pi one and pi two of the numbers one through L. And then each user either gets the first permutation or the second permutation. Um, Okay, so here's just an example of two permutations. And the goal is to take two hops between these permutations. So what I mean by that is, so we'll start with the first permutation. And it's it's two, so we'll go to the second index of the second one. There's a four. So then we'll go back to the fourth index of the first permutation, so three. So then we'd like to output three. And then that, that's what we'll call solving the pointer chasing problem. And so I won't go through the proof. Or, but I guess what we can show is using our histogram protocol. So in the shuffle model, using our histogram protocol, we can solve the pointer chasing problem with a constant number of samples. Um, however, in the local model shown by um, Joseph Mount Roth, if we want to solve this problem in the local model, we need to have, have at least L samples. So we have a, a separation between the shuffle model and local model for with for this sample complexity problem. All right, thank you. So if you have any questions, we can ask short questions or we can uh, uh, put all the questions at the end of the session. Uh, I, I just reminded everyone that uh, you can post questions and uh, I can go over them and select them <clears throat> for the end of the session. Let's go to, uh, let's thank the speaker and let's go to the second uh, talk of today's uh, session. The second talk um, is uh, Pure Differentially Private Summation from Anonymous Messages. This is a paper by Badi Ghazi, Noah Golovich, Ravi Kumar, Pasin Manurangsi, Rasmus Pe and Ameya Valinke and uh, Noah will be giving the short talk. Uh, great, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, so thank you and uh, thanks to everyone for, for joining in today and thanks to all the organizers for organizing uh, this conference um, online. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the problem of binary summation uh, with pure differential privacy. So in this problem, there's n users, and each user i holds a bit xi, and their goal is to compute the sum of their bits in a way that's differentially private. So there's a few models in which it's been standard to study this question. 
The first is the central model of differential privacy, where they assume the existence of a trusted analyzer A, which can add privacy preserving noise to the sum of their bits. So in this model, each user sends their bit XI in the clear to the trusted analyzer, who then outputs some random integer A of X1 through Xn. And we require that the mapping that takes the input data set X1 through Xn to A of X1 through Xn is epsilon delta differentially private. And we call that what this means is that for all neighboring data sets X and X prime, which differ in a single element, the distribution of A of X is similar to the distribution of A of X prime, where the distance between these distributions is quantified in some way by the parameters epsilon and delta. In the local model of differential privacy, we remove the assumption of a trusted analyzer, and therefore the users have to add the privacy preserving noise themselves. So they do this by passing their input through what we call a local randomizer, which is denoted by R here. So each user holding a bit XI sends the output of R of XI, which is in general a number of discrete messages to the untrusted analyzer, which can then perform an arbitrary computation A on the outputs of the local randomizers. And we say that the protocol induced by the local randomizer R is epsilon delta DP in the local model of the mapping that takes X to R of X is epsilon delta dp. So here reviewing x is a data set consisting of a single element. Now one issue with the local model is that um, requires adding a lot of noise and this can lead to quite large errors, much larger than what the central model guarantees. And this motivates uh, other models such as in this talk, we're gonna talk about the shuffle model to decrease the noise without making the stronger assumption of a trusted analyzer. So in the shuffled model, uh, it's defined in a way that's similar to the local model but we make the additional assumption of a trusted shuffler S, which takes as input uh, the, uh, a bunch of messages from the local randomizers, and it permutes all of the messages it receives from all of the local randomizers. Uh, the output of the shuffler, which is, uh, can be thought of as a bunch of anonymous messages, is then sent to the untrusted analyzer who can perform an arbitrary computation. And we say that the algorithm induced by the local randomizer R and the shuffler S is epsilon delta DP in the shuffled model. If the mapping that takes the user's data set X1 to Xn to the output of the shuffler S of, of R of X1 through R of Xn is itself epsilon delta DP. So in this talk, we're gonna be concerned with the case of pure differential privacy, which is defined to be the case where delta equals zero. Basically all the prior work in the shuffled model has really focused on the case of positive delta. And having peer privacy um, can lead to some new neat theoretical questions. And it can also be appealing in practice because it leads to stronger privacy guarantees and it is one fewer parameter you have to tune. Okay, so now I'll introduce some of the prior works on binary summation and then talk about our own results. So in the central model, the well-known Laplacian mechanism uh, gets error on the order of one over epsilon where epsilon is the privacy parameter. This is pure privacy, um, but it's known that in the local model, the best possible error you can get must grow with the square root of the number of users n. Um, and this is uh, achieved by Warner's randomized response. And this is essentially best possible. Uh, so that really bad error in the, in the local model introduces, uh, has motivated uh, work in the shuffle model, uh, which is, uh, and, and in Shudal showed in, in a couple years ago, that if you shuffle the outputs of randomized response, then you can achieve error, which is roughly only logarithmic in the number of users again, with uh, only order of one communication. And there's also been some follow-up work in the shuffle model on reducing the error further down to order of one over epsilon uh, at the cost of increasing the number of, of bits per user, namely the communication cost, which is now roughly log n. So all of this work in the shuffle model, which improves upon the local model, uh, has, uh, has uh, relied on the case, uh, basically uh, only, only works for approximate privacy where delta is positive. So uh, in this paper, we give the first algorithm, which is epsilon zero differentially private in the shuffled model. Our algorithm has error uh, roughly one over epsilon to the 1.5 and requires each user to send log n bits as the output of the local randomizer to the shuffler. Uh, we also show a corresponding lower bound, which shows that for any protocol which is error less than root n, namely the best possible in the local model, uh, each user must send at least root log n bits to the shuffler. 
the communication must be at least root login. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll quickly overview our, our algorithm and then talk about um, uh, some, some open questions. Um, here's our algorithm for binary summation, which achieves the error uh, of one over epsilon to the 1.5. Uh, there's two parameters. There is a P, which represents the probability, and a odd integer D, which represents the number of messages uh, the local randomizer will send. So given an input bit X, the local randomizer outputs a total of D bits. Each bit is a single message. And uh, these bits are chosen uh, so that T of them are equal to one, and D minus T of them are equal to zero, where T is a random integer, which is chosen as follows. Uh, with probability P, which should be interpreted as something that's kind of small, uh, T will basically be noise. It'll be a discrete Laplacian uh, with mean D over two. And with the remaining probability, one minus P, uh, T is basically signal. So uh, depending on whether X is zero or one, T will either be D minus one over two or D plus one over two. So to make this a little more concrete, here's an example uh, with D equals nine and P equals a 10th. Uh, shown in red and blue are the probability mass functions of the output of the local randomizer. Um, and notice that depending on whether the input X is equal to zero or, or one, uh, with overwhelming probability, we're going to output either T equals four or, or T equals five. And with some small probability P, um, there is this kind of uh, the noise you can see at the bottom, which is, which is given by discrete Laplace. So what our main theorem states is if we consider each of these n local randomizers, which behaves as is shown here, um, then the shuffle model protocol induced by this, uh, the total of dn messages from all n local randomizers uh, is epsilon zero differentially private for appropriate settings of the parameters p and d. So p has to be roughly one over n, and d, the communication cost, has to be roughly log n. And I haven't told you what the analyzer does. All it does is a simple debiasing step where it counts the number of ones and, and corrects for the bias. Uh, but that's uh, fairly straightforward. And, and really the kind of the hard part of this, of, of our algorithm, proving our algorithm works is, is to show that privacy holds. Okay, so we have some additional results in our paper. We have a, a lower bound which shows that any protocol with error which is better than the best possible in the local model. Uh, the communication must be at least root log n. And we also have applications of our local DP or of our um, pure DP protocol uh, for real valued summation and histogram computation. And you can see our paper for more details. Um, finally, I'll conclude with a couple of open questions. Um, it'd be nice to have generic tools to analyze pure DP in the shuffled model, similar to the amplification by shuffling results uh, for the case of approximate differential privacy. And it'd also be interesting to close the gap in the error and in communication between our upper bounds and our lower bounds. So great, thank you all for listening. So I have a quick question here. <clears throat> Do we have characterization of the optimal uh, distribution of the randomizer? For example, in your case, when input is zero, you have uh, output uh, of the randomizer from a distribution D0. When your uh, uh, X is one, it is from distribution D1. Do we have information theoretic guarantees on how the optimal D0 versus D1, uh, like how they look like, or uh, do we have some approximations to the optimal distributions? Uh, we don't, uh, I guess for, for the case of pure differential privacy here, uh, we, we don't really know what's optimal. Um, so actually I will share my screen again. Um, so uh, note that there is a gap between uh, what we get, which is one over epsilon to the 1.5, and uh, the one over epsilon in the uh, central model. And it's known that basically the Laplace mechanism is essentially optimal for the central model. Um, but we don't know of any, we don't know if our uh, local randomizer is optimal for the shuffled model with pure differential privacy. There might be something totally different that gets better. So let's move to the uh, last talk of this session, the power of synergy in differential privacy, uh, combining a small curator with local randomizers. This is a joint work of Amos Bimal, uh, Sasha Korolova, Kobi Nisim, Or Shafet, Uri, uh, and Uri Stemmer. And Uri will be giving the talk. 
Okay, so hi. Um, this is a joint work with Amos Bemel, Alexandra Kurolova, Kobe Nisim, and Or Shefet, and it's about a hybrid model that combines the central curator model and the local model. So before I'll tell you what is the uh, hybrid model, I want to quickly remind you, even though we saw it in the previous uh, talks, what are the central model and what, uh, what is the central and what is the local model of differential privacy. Right, so in the central model of differential privacy, we have, uh, let's say, M individuals who contribute their data to a central curator who aggregates their data with differential privacy. Right, so the users, the individuals, they fully trust the curator with their data, they give it the raw data, and the curator promises to aggregate this data in a differential private manner. What it means is that if we were to arbitrarily change the data of one individual, so the computed statistics should hide this difference in the sense that the computed statistics should remain distributed roughly the same. Okay, I have your, the formal definition of differential privacy, but I'm not going to get into it because I have only eight minutes uh, and we saw it uh, kind of in the previous talks. Anyways, um, the downside for the central curator model is that the users need to fully trust the central curator. So in, an, in order to avoid that need for trust, uh, the local model of differential privacy was defined. And in the local model of differential privacy, instead of the users giving their raw data to the curator, let's call it now a referee because it doesn't store uh, a database of raw data anymore. So now the users uh, apply locally on their device some uh, randomization procedure that satisfies differential privacy and only send the curator or the referee the outcome of this randomization procedure. So the user, users keep their data and only send randomizations. And now the privacy requirement is that, says that if I were to arbitrarily change the input of one individual, then the distribution on messages that these users send to the referee remains roughly the same. And so, the collection of all messages that the referee obtains uh, in this protocol remains roughly the same. So basically the referee cannot notice this change. And uh, in particular, this means that also the uh, statistics we compute from this uh, noisy data remains roughly the same. So the good thing is that the users don't need to trust the central curator anymore. Uh, they don't need to trust anybody and their privacy is guaranteed no matter what. But the downside, like we saw in the previous talks, is that accuracy is significantly reduced in general. So uh, this plus and minus kind of motivated um, uh, the thought of maybe we can somehow combine these two models into a hybrid model, and maybe we can get the best out of, uh, of the two worlds. Okay? So, uh, as a result, these guys here, they defined the hybrid model of differential privacy. And now the picture looks like that. So we have the vast, major vast majority of individuals, let's say any individuals, they still participate in a kind of a locally differentially private protocol. Okay, so they randomize their uh, data on their device and send the noisy message to the referee. And we kind of have a small data curator, it's small in the sense that the number of individuals who gave their data to the curator M is a very small number compared to N. So we have a small curator that holds a very small database and the, data, and the curator aggregates his data with differential privacy and sends the referee um, an aggregated statistics about this data that satisfies differential privacy. Then the referee gets all of these messages and computes whatever he needs to compute. So the motivation for such a model could be, uh, we can consider a company that has lots of users, N is a huge number of users, and the company wants to analyze the data of these users and to provide them with the strong privacy guarantees of the local model. In addition, the privacy is willing to uh, buy or obtain um, somehow the raw data from a small number of users, M users. And for those users, the company guarantees uh, standard differential privacy in the sense of the trusted curator. So the question is, what can we gain from such a combination? So more formally, we will 
consider protocols with interaction, so the picture looks more like that. The referee can interact back and forth with the small curator and can interact back and forth with the individuals, and then it needs to output whatever it want to, wants to output. And now the privacy requirement is that for any adversary controlling everybody but one player in this uh, uh, protocol here, the privacy of the data held by this party is guaranteed in the sense of differential privacy. So for example, if you consider an adversary controlling everybody except the small curator, then the adversary cannot distinguish between whether the data of the small curator was uh, in black like that, or, it, or if one of the entries in that database were to change like in green here. Here is another example. If the adversary controls everybody except uh, that single user here, then the adversary cannot distinguish between whether the input of that user was 27 or, or 14 or, or 15 or 90 or 20 or whatever. Okay. So um, our results regarding this model. Uh, first, we show, we, we show several examples for problems where the hybrid model provably helps. What I mean is that we show problems for which we, con we can construct an MN hybrid model protocol. So it's a protocol where the curator holds the data of M individuals and there are N individuals participating as local agents. So we can construct such a hybrid protocol, but we show that every centralized DP algorithm for that protocol requires uh, more much more than M individuals in order to solve that problem only in the central model. And you cannot solve this problem also in the local model alone if you only have N individuals. So if you have N individuals in the local model and M individuals in the central model, you cannot solve it in either of the models alone. But if you uh, consider a hybrid protocol, then you can solve it. The second type of results that we show, that we show uh, state that there are problems for which the hybrid model essentially does not help in the sense that if you can construct a hybrid protocol for uh, those problems with uh, M, uh, with the data of M, indi M individuals in the central model and the data of N individuals like participating as, a local, as local agents, then either you could solve this problem using the central model alone with your M individuals or you, or you can solve this problem in the local model alone using uh, the N individuals there. Uh, the third thing that we do is we study the round complexity and the com communication pattern of uh, protocols in the hybrid model. What we show is that there are problems that you cannot solve in this hybrid model without interaction. And we also show that some problems like force you to uh, communicate in a certain pattern of uh, communication between the parties in the hybrid model. For example, we uh, show a problem in which the first thing that needs to happen is that the curator, the small curator needs to send some message to the referee. The referee relays this information to the local agents and then the referee obtains uh, messages from the local agents and only then the referee can compute uh, the desired output. And we also show uh, example, an example for a problem that necessitates an interaction in the reverse direction. So in the second problem, like the referee must first obtain messages from the local agents relate to the curator and then obtain a message from the curator and only then he could compute his output. So um, to summarize what we, sh what we do is we uh, like initiate the theoretical study of this hybrid model of differential privacy. Uh, we show that many, for many tasks, you can gain a lot by uh, considering such, such a combination of a small curator with a large number of local agents. And I guess that the takeaway is that um, maybe this hybrid model can become uh, like something in our toolkit for designing uh, protocols for differential privacy. And that's it. Thank you. Let's thank all the speakers of this uh, session. Uh,
And uh, again, a reminder, please feel free to ask questions uh, regarding any particular paper presented in this session or covering uh, any questions that you have regarding all three papers or differential privacy in general. Uh, and the questions can be very open-ended because the next 15 minutes we are going to have a discussion about uh, differential privacy in general. So uh, since we have a very good panel, I'm sure they will be happy to answer all the questions that you have regarding differential privacy um, and anything particular about their paper. So uh, regarding, uh, uh, regarding this model where uh, we have um, uh, parties who are either giving uh, information to a central aggregator or having a curator to support, uh, help support their computation. Uh, I was thinking whether we can think of a genie who knows the input distribution and uh, in, uh, the distribution of the inputs of the parties and can provide rate limited assistance to both the parties and the curator to help them perform computation. For example, uh, if it was not rate limited, they can, you can implement um, a cryptographic protocols using the genie. But if it is rate limited, then uh, it will be a nice question as to how to help uh, the parties and the curator compute certain functions. It will be helpful if you can, uh, like, uh, if you have some opinions about that. So the question is if we can use uh, extra knowledge about the data distribution. Think of a genie who gives correlated randomness both to the curators, parties, and the aggregator. Can that genie give a small uh, rate limited like suggestion that can help increase the accuracy? I guess there's a sense in which the separation that Ori gave, the the results that Ori described, use something like that, where the but where the central model curator is extracting some relatively small piece of information that the many participants who are just whose data is protected locally can somehow take advantage of. So I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing. So in some sense, the central model curator can unlock effectively a small key that allows the local protocol to do something useful. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, Hamantha, or something related. I was just wondering, like, if you can study the, uh, a trade-off between uh, the uh, information that uh, uh, that this genie can provide, this genie that can provide assisting information to all the parties versus the improvement in uh, accuracy that one can achieve. I guess on a technical level, in some loose sense, you know, requiring that the central curator sends an epsilon differentially private message is, is sort of closely related to requiring that they send a short message. Um, and I mean, in some cases can be sort of formalized. So if you had sort of like quantitative bounds for sort of the whole range of like epsilon, you would potentially be able to say things about like, you know, trade off between like length of sort of length of hint and how much the hint helps. We had a few questions in the Q and A that might get thing, you know, that might be fodder for good discussion. That John, I know you'd identified a few. Do you want to uh, maybe bring those up? Uh, yeah. So I guess let me. So one question that came in through the chat uh, was, I guess for for Uri was, uh, I think sort of inferred for Uri was, what are the interesting open problems and sort of an like an accompanying, I guess question is is you mentioned. Um, problems for which you have separations. And the question is whether you consider these to be sort of natural problems, what it, uh, I interpreted the question to be, what, what does this say about natural problems? And maybe or you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, some of the problems are not natural, but uh, we have uh, one problem which we uh, 
thing that is it is natural and the I actually have slides for that so maybe I can quickly share that what do you say or is it too much uh, if, yeah I have one one minute uh, yeah so I'll just don't share but uh, <laughs> think about <clears throat> A problem where every the data of every individual is like uh, d uh, binary attributes, and what you uh, sampled from some distribution, and what you want to do is to identify like uh, the attribute with uh, the highest mean. First, you want to identify the attribute with the highest mean, and once you did that, you want to estimate its mean within a very very small precision. So. Um, if you have lots of individuals in the local model, then these users can once they know what is the right attribute, they can like uh, estimate the mean of that attribute within very high precision, but they kind of uh, can't, because of their privacy requirement, they kind of can't identify the correct attribute. So if you consider a mixture of both a central, a central curator with a very small amount of information, then that curator can identify the correct attribute and once you know that, then the local agents can uh, estimate its mean to a very high precision. <clears throat> and I think that that's kind of a, a natural problem. It has applications in, in biology, uh, also I've heard. And, uh, but we also consider more uh, you know, uh, funny problems. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, so we have a, a couple sort of like more maybe specific technical questions. So one for Noah is, uh, do you think there's a way to get lower bounds for binary sums that are not dependent on the communication complexity? And I guess presumably this would be for, uh, for pure, sort of in the pure differential privacy setting where there's some, uh, yeah, yeah so in, in the, yeah. Uh, anyway, N Noah, uh, can you, uh, Right. Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, we don't we don't know. I mean, uh, so there is a there is a gap uh, between uh, one over epsilon to one point five for our upper bound, and then we know the best possible is one over epsilon. So I think that's probably the main lower bound that uh, uh, this question is referring to. And um, uh, I, I don't know uh, which one of those is correct, or if there's something in between. But I do believe that in order to improve upon our protocol. Uh, or protocols error of one over epsilon to the 1.5, uh, it, it will probably be necessary to switch to a very different protocol. Um, when we're bounding the tail probabilities kind of to prove privacy, uh, there doesn't seem to be much leeway in these kind of, in the, in the proof in, the, in these probabilities. So um, I think we'll have to switch to a different algorithm. Okay, thank you. So I have a question in general regarding how do we measure accuracy of these protocols? So for example, currently a wrong answer is a wrong answer. Like if you do not get the correct answer, it's just counts as one incorrectness. Um, but some answers can be more wrong as compared to others. For example, if you are working on the real number or integers, a, a further answer will be, should be counted more inaccurate as compared to a, a nearby uh, incorrect answer. Uh, do we have protocols that uh, has different ways of measuring uh, accuracy in this manner? So for, for binary summation, we're just measuring error, which is gonna be the distance between what we predict and the true sum. So it's just absolute distance. Um, I guess other papers in this session have different measures of error. Uh, this was a question in general about differential privacy. Like, um, a, a, so for example, if you have four objective questions, A, B, C, D, a, if B is the correct answer, everyone else is incorrect. But uh, suppose my answer is five, six is a better incorrect answer than 17. So typically in differential privacy, you, you do, like, you don't try to say, like, what is the probability that somebody outputs, like, you know that we guess someone's data right you have some something like what is the sum of everyone's data you know you say, how many people answered six or what is the average and we you know you say that you want the average to be within some parameter alpha so you do say that if the average is you know 4.2 then 4.1 is a much better answer than zero um 
So it, it is usually, sometimes, yeah, so there is some notion of, of error. Um, so let me give a sort of more high level question. So Daniel and, and uh, Amit Agrawal sort of ask related questions. So, um, right, so the sort of motivation for like both of these different models is that to, to try to sort of simulate the power of having a central data holder without actually having one. And of course, multi-party computation in some, you know, at a high level sort of just solves that problem. Um, and this is sort of an, both of these deal with sort of interesting models that sit like in between general multi-party computation and the local model, which is like some very restricted form of multi-party computation. Um, and it's, the question is basically what, what other models sit sort of in between these things? Do you have any thoughts on sort of what is the, the next model, um, Daniel in particular asked what about uh, allowing only say linear functions on the inputs, which is um, motivated by the fact that MPC for linear functions is much more efficient. Um, so I guess anyone is free to jump in with an answer here. Uh, I'll take, okay. I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> Another non-speaker will <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Since uh, I'll use my panelist general chair power to <laughs> jump in. Uh, it's a good question. There, there, um, it makes a, you know, it makes a lot of sense. So in, in particular, there is lots of work on what you can and cannot do using just a certain class of linear functions of the input plus appropriate noise, like uh, roughly what's called the SQ model in learning. Um, and there, you know, there are upper bounds and lower bounds and a lot of, a lot of natural algorithms can be run in that, in that model. And so if you had the right kind of MPC, um, you would get that sort of more or less, uh, you know, directly. Uh, and I think it, there's actually some nice open questions about MPC in terms of uh, that that raises in terms of how do you get, you know, MPC protocols for that kind of functionality at sufficient scale. Um, and we have, you know, there, there are various things that do some version of this, but like, I don't know if there's a perfect general solution. Uh, and then, and then there are some open questions about the power of like these models, these types of queries in, you know, within the subset of differentially private algorithms, there are some problems where we have good, a good sense of how far it gets you and some others where we don't. So it's an interesting, an interesting sort of sub area to figure out. I, I guess I will use my executive powers. It's a it's 10 o'clock. So it's a great question, I think, to, to end on. Um, so maybe we can thank thank all the speakers uh, in the session one more time with some sort of like Zoom applause. Um, and yeah, thank, thanks to everyone who asked questions and everyone who, who participated and thanks to the speakers. Great to